Hey, this is Phil, a.k.a. Corinne. And I'm Alex Berg, and you're listening to the I'm I'm from from Driftwood Driftwood Podcast. Podcast. If you just can't get enough of I'm from Driftwood, go check out its YouTube channel. The stories have tens of millions of views and over 100,000 subscribers. And a new story is uploaded every week. You can also browse every story it's ever published since it launched in 2009. Speaking of stories, let's get to today's episode. On today's show, we hear two stories about trans youth. Our first story comes from Matthew. So when I was about 12, I think, um, I think, I was still really confused. I, well, going into seventh grade, when I turned 12, I was, I had no clue who I was. I wanted to think that I did, but I really didn't. I had come out as a lesbian earlier that year. I was in what people would call the rainbow phase, where, you know, you're kind of out and proud about like everything and you don't shut up about it. I ended up meeting um, one of my friends who actually introduced me to the world of gender identity. They're pretty much like my brother now, but I essentially didn't know that like there was anything other than male or female. Like I knew trans people existed, but I didn't think that was something to be in my universe. As time went on, I was like, okay, I'm definitely not 100% girl. This just isn't a thing. Cause I learned that like, besides male, female, trans male, trans female, there's like a whole spectrum of other things. And I was blown away. So I sort of swam around in like the field of identities for a while. I was gender fluid for a while. I was X, Y, Z. I was a demi girl for a while, which is like, you feel like part of you is non-binary and part of you is female. And um, then I came out as non-binary, which I came out as to my mother. I think I knew deep down I was really a male, I was really a boy. I had said um, I was a boy in the mirror before, like I'd said I was every identity in the book in the mirror before because, you know, I wanted to figure out who I was and I figure saying things out loud is one of the best ways to become sure of that. I would stand and look in the mirror and I would tell myself I am female, I am non-binary, I am a boy. I'd say all these different things trying to see what stuck. And I said I was a boy and that really just kind of it, it stuck to the wall. Um, so I knew that that was who I was, but I shoved it deep down in like the biggest pits of denial I had within me. Cause I just, I figured if I identified as non-binary or something like that, my parents wouldn't be losing a daughter, but it was still just close enough for me to still feel comfortable in who I was. Fast forward a few months, identifying as non-binary for about half a year in June, of about two years ago, because I got my, uh, three years ago, sorry, um, I got a drum set for the first time. My mom had either a friend or a relative, I don't remember, who was giving away this electronic drum set that they had never opened for $200, which is very cheap. So my mom was like, I'm gonna get you this thing. And I just was kind of freaking out. It wasn't a birthday thing. It wasn't a Christmas thing. This was just because my mom wanted to feed the fire that I had for music. I came home to see this big black electronic drum set, because I don't have a real drum set, um, all set up. And I learned my first song in a day. The same person who introduced me to the world of gender identity introduced me into 21 Pilots, <laughs> which the best band of all time. Anyone can fight me on that. Um, and they have this drummer whose name is Josh Dunn. And he had mental health experiences that were very similar to mine in regards to anxiety. And I just, I saw this guy and I was like, I want to be that. Once I picked up the drums, it gave me this feeling like I am Josh Dunn. <laughs> and it, um, it just allowed me to keep pushing forward. And then that gradually inspired like a love for music that expanded beyond the world of drums. And then as time went on, like I, this is actually a week later, I learned, um, I was on learning my third song and I was playing the drums with my shirt off. I was just beating the crap out of this drum set, pouring out all my emotion because regardless of how I identified, dysphoria was always a part of my life that loomed over me. So as I was beating the crap out of this drum set with my shirt off, my mother walked in. Granted, it was like 1am. I was supposed to be asleep, but I was playing the drums. She was just like, you're going to wake up your little brother. Then she kind of looked at me, not in a bad way, but she just looked at me sort of not confused. She was like sure of what was going on, but something had changed in the way she was looking at me. And um, when she walked out of the room, um, I had already put away my drum stuff and I had crawled into bed. We talked over text for a little while. And she told me that I was her son. And I was really confused because I'm like, no, I'm non-binary. What's up with that? And she was like, no, you're like, this tells me that you are a boy. You're my son. And I was, I sort of 
still was saying, haha, no, I'm non-binary, because I didn't want to have to face all that was going to come after. But apparently to her, the energy I was exuding was like so purely male that she just kind of knew. So later that night, during the conversation, maybe like an hour in, um, I kind of con didn't concede, but sort of accepted. I was like, yeah, mom, you're right. Like, that's, that's fair. She kind of passed the torch of certainty onto me, being like, here, you can know who you are now. It kind of, everything sort of took that small shift and was in place. And like, it was the last piece that I needed to that specific puzzle of my life. I think I was so filled with emotions that I sort of numbed myself. And then I sort of went to sleep and I woke up the next day and it was like the world had color. <laughs> Everything was kind of more real and it was out there. And, um, you know, I could sort of see things. And I saw myself in the mirror as who I was. And it was just, I started living my life instead of surviving it. Immediately the next day, I posted on my Snapchat. I was like, hey, so my mom figured some stuff out. <laughs> And um, yeah, then I've been out ever since then. I came out to my dad shortly after that, but I've just had, I've been so lucky to have the life that I do. When I look in a mirror now, besides just wondering if my hair looks good, um, I, right now I just kind of see not who I am, but I see the potential of the person that I could become. And that's one of the biggest, most important things to me because I used to think, I used to not be able to picture myself waking up the next day but now I can picture myself living through the years and getting a job and becoming a writer and playing music for a band and doing all of these great things. And it's really just being able to see who you could be rather than who you are at the moment. So in this story, I felt that I was like being schooled <laughs> by Matthew because at the end of the story, he just says a couple of quotes that I just kind of want to read and just sit with for a while because I think they were great. He says, and then I sort of went to sleep and I woke up one day and it was like the world had color. Everything was kind of more real and it was out there. And, you know, I could start to see things and I saw myself in the mirror as who I was. And I just started living my life instead of surviving. it. And that's Matthew talking about what it feels like to own his identity, to own the identity that felt really authentic to him. And I just thought it was so beautiful to hear him talk about owning that finally and what it felt like to actually be living and not just surviving, not just like in this in-between place, but like actually thriving as a boy. I actually wrote down that same quote that says ah. I started living my life and not just surviving it it's because so I was also, that is such a, just a wise way of phrasing it. And I feel like something so relatable to so many LGBTQ plus people is that honestly, for so much of your existence, you're just trying to survive and get by. And then I completely understand that feeling of you finally get it. It's like the pieces click, the switch flips, and all of a sudden it just makes sense. And so you really just get that from what he was saying about everything's in color and being able to actually do more than just get by. You know, one part of the story where Matthew talks about like going to the mirror and trying on these various identities, it's like much like being in a, in a dressing room at a store and trying on a shirt, trying several shirts to see which one looks the best. And I thought that was so brilliant, like for somebody so, so young, this idea of being like, okay, I am non-binary. I am demi-girl. I am male. Like it was amazing to see him doing that. And then knowing that when the right identity, when he said the right identity, how it would feel and resonate, I totally actually related to that because I feel like when I came out initially and I came out as a lesbian, I remember being like saying that to myself and then being like, it's very interesting how much knowledge and understanding your body holds, right? So the, sometimes you will say something that you're not really quite ready to admit to yourself and you'll say something and you have this gut emotion, this feeling in your body that it's just like shakes you. I had that. Like when I was first coming out as a lesbian, I remember saying it to myself and being like, I felt like this pang in my, in my lower abdominal area where it was just like, oh! oh no, this might be true. And it was like kind of scary. Yeah. So I, I understood. I thought it was so brilliant that he did this exercise of trying on these identities. And yeah. then the one that fit was the one that resonated and he could he feel it in his body and he knew, yes, this is true for me. Yeah. Or it's like, you're opening the door to something. And once, you know, it's opened a little bit, you're like, yeah. I can't close this now. You know, <laughs> one of the takeaways that I had from his story was I felt like one piece of why he was holding on to the gender he was assigned at birth or wanting to even identify as non-binary before identifying as male was it felt like 
he was almost worried about what it meant to let go of that because of his parents. And it's just so remarkable to me that kids are so perceptive that even at such a young age, even if you have accepting parents or you haven't explicitly been told that you have to stay the way you are or something like that, but you, you know enough to know that you could be letting people down if the person they think they know you to be is somehow different than the person that you really are. So I just thought that that was so perceptive. And I feel like it just speaks volumes to the way that kids absorb so much information and so much in terms of social norms, so much information of just how, what they're exposed to in terms of living in an anti-LGBTQ society generally. So I just, I was struck by that because it felt like Matthew was almost holding on to this old self for other people in some ways. You know, we, we've all been there. Like I definitely know when I was coming out, there were times where I was like, oh, nope, let's put that back in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was like, my life was like, no, you're not putting anything back in. It's, it, this is, this is really happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is, yeah. Up next, we hear from Marcella, the mother of a trans child who was pleasantly surprised by a group of first graders. I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin and went to high school there. I have a distinct memory in high school of being in the hallway near my locker. Someone walked by and said, you know, hey, you're a lesbian. And um, it was, you know, it was with this very angry tone. I was confused and I didn't really know what that all meant actually. And then they were said, oh, you use a double header which I did not know what that was at the time. Then I got even more confused and they're like, you don't even know what you are, um, but that's what you are, you're a lesbian. It was a very scary moment for me because I knew that um, it, wouldn't, it, it wasn't going to be easy if that's what I was, but I knew at that time I, I was different. Fast forward 25 years um, and I'm happily married to my wife and live in Seattle, Washington. We have two beautiful children and life is going quite well. One day, um, my youngest son says to me, I had bought outfits for them, um, dress up clothes, because there was gonna be an event, um, piano recital. And um, I'm showing you know, him the outfits and he says, you, you never listen to me. And it startled me because that wasn't typically how you know, he had spoken to me. And so I sat down at the kitchen table and said, honey, I'm listening, what am I not hearing? And he said, I want to wear a dress. And so I said, okay, you know, dress up, dress up clothes, totally fine. We're open in our house, let's go. So we went to Target and um, I just was trying to be very open and say, you can go anywhere, you can do anything, you know, anywhere for your shopping. And he went directly over to the, um, the girl's clothes, picked out an extremely frilly girly dress, a cardigan, tights, shoes, and a hair bow to match. We were in the dressing room, and I just remember being there thinking, okay, you know, don't mess this up, like be, be calm, be neutral, don't say too many, you know, feminine words or whatever, so just whatever, just try to be calm. He turned around and his head was down and was waiting for my reaction. And so I said, you look nice because it wasn't beautiful or feminine or anything. And then I, I'll never forget, he just turned around and held out the dress, looked in the mirror and the head was held high and spun around back at me and said, I feel like me. And I just remember getting chills everywhere. And I texted my wife and said, this is really happening. You know, time went on, um, decided, you know, at several weeks to, you know, um, she, her pronouns, changed her name. So um, one Friday I was walking the school bus. Um, so in Seattle, um, we walk we walk the kids to school. And so a walking school bus is just a group of kids that all are from one neighborhood and that's how they get to school. And so a parent is in charge of a particular day to kind of drive the bus. Um, and so that was Friday's my day to drive the bus. And um, Rosemary wasn't in school yet. She's still in preschool, but she helps me drive the bus on Fridays. Um, and so she was in transition during this time. And um, there was one child on the bus that was having a particularly hard time with her transition. He was a first grader and he would come over and her hair was growing longer and he would grab fistfuls of her hair and say, where's your boy hair? And so, or one day she was wearing a skirt and lift up her skirt, where's your boy parts? And I would just try to redirect him. And so she was always holding my hand on the walking school bus, staying really close because I think she was a little afraid. And I was just walking, you know, the kids through that, you know, some people might be a, have a little difference of opinions about it. 
but then this particular day I must have been in a raw place or something, but um, we were walking and um, this child came running up and I was holding her hand and I could see him coming. He came running up and said, you're a transgender. I know what you are, you're a transgender. And right, just like that, I was back in high school, standing at my locker and I froze. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to do. We weren't using that term in our house. This was just gender exploration. You could be whatever you wanted to be. And Rosemary looked up at me with her little five-year-old eyes and said, what's a transgender? And she knew that by the tone that it wasn't a good thing. Um, at least to this child, and he had picked on her enough to know that. And so she, he just kept repeating it and repeating it. And I started to cry, <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. My older son came over and said, he saw, he saw this going on, he knew this child was picking on his sister, and said, well, in our house, we believe that you can be born a boy and be a girl, and you can love anyone you want to love, and you, we will love you no matter what in our house. The same child kept repeating, but, but it's a transgender, it's a transgender. And the other kids were like, so what, who cares? And I was like, wow, this is incredible. I can't believe this is happening. So I was just like, pull yourself together. Okay, everyone, like keep walking the school bus. We got to cross the street. And I just kept crying and walking and thinking, this is incredible. These kids are incredible and we've evolved and it's okay, we're gonna be okay. She never asked again what transgender was. Atticus, our older son, knows what the term means. Um, and we just said, you can be whatever you wanna be, and if you wanna be a boy tomorrow, you can do that, doesn't matter. We did write a letter to the parents on the walking school bus explaining um, that something had happened on the school bus and that we're not using that term and that um, please, you know, and that what we're using is gender exploration and, you know, isn't it a great world that you can be whatever you want to be? And, um, and so, and that was received really well. Um, so, you know, that was kind of how we handled it. Before the walking school bus um, incident or story, um, you know, I really kind of felt like I was just, um, we, were, we were a family with two moms and that's just who we were. We were, um, you know, walking the world with just being um, that. But now I really feel like we're a queer, pr proud family and that's okay. And we um, really need to um, own that and um, go out into the world and um, help people understand that um, we're different and Back in high school, I was different and felt shame by that. And now I'm starting to really own my differences and own my children's differences and um, not only accept it, but be proud of that. What she walks away with from this story is that as a parent who is in a same sex relationship, you know, her kids have two moms and they have a child that is transitioned. She realizes that it's very important for her and her family to be visible, to be out and visible so that people can see that a queer family, no matter what the configuration is, it's very normal. They're still a family and there are other families that need to see that out in the world. Yeah, I thought that Marcella and her family, they're so affirming of their daughter. And she also talks about how when they were at Target and her daughter expressed wanting to try on a dress and how she's just really, I think as a parent, such a paradigm of how to be accepting. But then also you hear about how this like child taunting her daughter mm. is just brutal for her and so triggering for her and bringing her back to those moments when she herself was bullied. And the other thing that it just made me think about is kids don't learn to bully other kids like that. They don't learn specific terms. They don't learn that stuff is bad at such a young age, unless they're hearing it from adults. So the whole time I was just thinking like, and, you know, I know Marcella said that she wrote a letter to this kid's family, but I was like, you know, this kid probably maybe doesn't realize what the implication of actually what they're doing. They know that they're trying to be mean and awful. And it was just really sad. And it's like, kids don't learn those words unless they're hearing it from the adults in their lives. So I just feel like it's so important to just keep that in mind. And the other big takeaway that Marcella had too was that all of this is about learning to embrace your differences and not feeling shame for them. And I thought that she so 
made it so clear when she was saying that when she was back in high school and she was bullied for being a lesbian, that at that point, being called out for being different made her feel shame. And now when people express that she's different or her family's different, that's something that she can embrace. And I just think that that's such a good lesson to learn. As an LGBTQ person, I frankly really like that I'm different from other people. I don't want to be the same as other people. And I think that that's part of learning to embrace the difference. You know, it's interesting that you can see that she is sort of re-traumatized by watching this situation unfold. And it just really speaks to how if you experience bullying or something like that at a young age, that how much of an impact it can have in your life, right? So this is years later, you see that she's gotten re-traumatized by watching the situation happen. And then you have these kids who literally have to step in and kind of diffuse the situation because she's just, she is like in the trauma of the moment. And it's, it's too hard to get out of that. It's, you know, she's the adult in the situation, yet she was definitely reliving something that had happened to her when she was in high school. And as much as kids learn how to bully from adults, they also learn how to be upstanders, which we saw with all of these kids who were like, I don't see a big deal about that. Like, leave her alone. So props to these kids. You know, in this national moment, when transgender children have been inserted in the culture war by people who are acting in bad faith and being bigots. I feel like these stories also go to show these kids know who they are. These kids absolutely have a strong sense of who they are. And, and the people who are the ones who are having the problems are the adults and the people who can't accept them for who they are. Totally true. So well said. And I'm glad that we're in a place right now where people are allowing kids to figure out or tell them who they are, right? Because we, we come from a time when there, we, there wasn't a whole lot of that. They're like, they're too young. How would they know? They know. They know exactly who they are and let, we should listen to them and let them tell us. And if, and if it changes, if it shifts, if it morphs, then you have to go with that. Like, we got to go with what they're telling us. Absolutely. Driftwood Podcast is hosted by Phil, a.k.a. Corinne and Alex Berg, and is produced by Andy Egan Thorpe. It's recorded as a program of I'm From Driftwood, the LGBTQAI plus story archive. Its mission is to send a life-saving message to queer and trans people everywhere. You are not alone. I'm From Driftwood's founder and executive director is Nathan Mansky. Its program director is Damian Middlefeld. Our score is provided by Elevate Audio. The stories you heard today are available in their entirety, plus thousands more at imfromdriftwood.org. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Or subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Additional funding is provided by the Humanities New York Sharp Grant with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. Thanks for listening, y'all.